Paparazzi were everywhere around this film. Anything spoken on the radio had to be very direct and very accurately said. There was one moment where they were setting up between shots and Pitt and Jolie were just off the side and they were playing ping pong. And someone was at went on the radio was like, where are Pitt and Jolie? And the, the assistant just goes, oh, they're screwing around over here. And the, and the oh, lineman no. was like, no, 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 you can't say things like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, just f***ing around. They're, yeah. they're playing with balls. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> ping-ponging. I mean, they're, they're not I mean they've got their paddles out. All you need is smiles. She's playing with his balls. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they're knocking balls around. <laughs> they're, they're just they're f***ing. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Every possible word is sexual. Yeah. Making stuff is hard, especially in the entertainment world, where big egos, bigger budgets, and just plain bad luck can make things go horribly wrong. And we're going behind the scenes of these disastrous, never-ending, and often dangerous productions to find out why it was a shit show. Hello, friends. I'm Ian. This is It Was a Shit Show. I'm joined by Clint. Hello. And Ray. Hello. That was weird. That's like a what East European. <laughs> yeah, because spies. This movie's Hello. about spies. Hello. <laughs> yoo <Yoo-hoo. Yeah>, Hello. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Uh, yeah. Now I'm German. Better. Okay. Um, as of recording this, you two will not have seen my newest video about the born identity. Okay. So uh, I'm almost done writing it. But long story short, many of that film's problems come down to director Doug Lyman. As the LA Times puts it, several people who have worked with Lyman say he suffers from indecision and lack of focus so profound <laughs> that his films were finished more in spite of him than because of him. Oh, my wow. God. How does somebody uh, like that get into the, the, the film industry? He's a white man. Uh, let me guess. Is he a white man? Yes. Yeah. I'm very familiar with these type of people. So this is basically true for his entire filmography. Everything from his cult classics like Swingers and Go to big budget fare like Edge of Tomorrow, which is absolutely a future episode. Uh, but today... Let's talk Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I actually had an experience on uh, the finale of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. There's a shootout with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie in, in an Ikea, and I wanted to play it without any music. So I thought it was way more dramatic. And the uh, head of the studio, David Madelon, brought me into his office and said, you know, I've, I've had you know, fights with studio executives my whole career. And he was like, you made this movie for $120 million. You know, if you made it for like $40 million, you could play the finale without music. But you made it for $120 million, and so we kind of need middle America. We need them just to have a good time so we can make our money back. And it wasn't, it wasn't that big a deal. I was like, you know, I, I get it. You want it to be a little less exciting and a little bit more fun. Okay, so let's set up Doug Lyman. Um, so uh, you kind of give I an idea wait. here. All right. <laughs> you you told me you were like you're going to be so triggered by this episode. Oh yeah, I gave you a bunch of wonderful yeah. quotes that you're just going to be uh, like, we we can't. I, you guys won't be able to hear her eye twitch. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's gonna... I'll try to make it really loud. Just like it's going to sound like a gun cocking. Is what yeah. it's going to sound like. <laughs> <laughs> Someone in my eye is going to crack its knuckles. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so many times. <laughs> Uh, here are the many different ways Doug Lyman has been described in articles and by other people. Inexperienced, idiosyncratic, brilliant, chaotic, unorganized, indecisive, perfectionist, mensch, creative, restless, eccentric, immature, indulgent, irresponsible, indecisive, brilliant, <laughs> idiot savant, balls of steel, Blithely indifferent, Mr. Magoo. Oh my God. <laughs> and he has called himself flippant and paranoid. <laughs> wow. A lot of those describe me in high school. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great <laughs> list of words. I think you I think you used brilliant and indecisive twice, but I guess that that means that other people have said that. Said multiple that multiple times. times. Yeah. Oh, I did. Yeah. Is so, he indecisive? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
Mm. <laughs> Maybe brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Doug Lyman, if you could probably guess already, is a bit of a spoiled rich kid. Um, his father is Arthur Lyman, who was a very famous lawyer. He uh, he did a lot of like entertainment mergers, like with Warner Brothers and stuff like that. But he was very famous for being like the lead prosecutor during the Iran Contra trials. Oh wow! So um, so he was a big deal. Lyman Doug was a bit of the troubled child in his family. The rest mm. of his siblings went on to be like doctors and stuff like that. But he chose <laughs> to be a director. And much to the chagrin of everyone who's ever like struggled in the industry, like when he made Swingers, John Favreau was kind of like, well, he's like, well, if this doesn't work out, I guess I'll be going back to being a bartender. Mm -hmm. And then Lyman was like, I don't care. Like, yeah, he's got something to fall back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, uh, a trust fund kid. Dad, yes, exactly. He's absolutely a trust fund kid. Okay, so speaking of John Favreau, um, he says working with him on Swingers was not easy, but looking back, it's easier to appreciate his methods. Clint, this is John Favreau. His persona is something he cultivates. There's part of him that is him, part of him he creates. He enjoys the image he projects of being a mad scientist of cinema, it gives him leeway. So that's even more annoying to me. <laughs> okay, we're gonna I mean, we're gonna like, keep diving into these. I mean, these... we all have like parts of ourselves that we like. You know, like if, when I'm around you two, I'm a different version of myself than I'm say around yeah. like my parents. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. just because your of... work life or right, your family life right, or your right, friends' right. life. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. but when you're like buying into this view that of just like oh I'm like a brilliant like genius and like, oh, I can't be bothered to like be organized or like know things or like know when meetings are happening because I'm too smart. Okay. We're only on the first quote. We oh got a lot more to go. <laughs> Look, okay, I have a lot is, to say. I have is, a lot to is, say. This is John already. Favreau again. I think there's a method to his madness. I don't know how it works, to be honest with you. I do know <laughs> that the guy is able to pull it off every time. <sighs> 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 okay. This is John August. Oh my God. Who was the writer and producer on Go. Um, and he, if for the people who don't know, he has his own podcast called Script Notes. Script Notes. And he, uh, probably the most famous stuff he's written uh, been Tim Burton movies. But he had to keep Lyman focused on set. So when John Favreau says, I don't know how he's able to pull it off, it's because of John August. No, so <laughs> because, so we're going to keep going into like Lyman needs somebody there that basically needs to handhold him mm. to keep him focused. And John Favreau was like, this was my baby for swingers, like, and he kept it focused. And then John August was like, no, dude, you got to, we got to do what I wrote here. Right? Yeah. Okay. So this is John August about Lyman's methods. He has that scrappy, let's try it this way quality. That's great when you're making swingers or go, but it's hard to scale it up to a big studio film. So when he did Born Identity, which was a sixty million dollar movie, he wanted to continue being like improvise, uh, like he wanted to be able to just pick up the camera and shoot everything guerrilla style. Mm -hmm. But you mm -hmm. can't do that when you have a no. crew of hundreds, yeah, and you need permits to be somewhere with that many people, yeah, right. Um, so especially when Matt Damon's jumping from building to building, yeah, exactly. So so and he had producer Frank Marshall to control him. And Frank Marshall has done so many things, lots of Steven Spielberg. And he's only directed like a couple of times, one of them being Congo. <laughs> um, mm. So uh, he had to pull Lyman kicking and screaming over the finish line to complete the Bourne identity. Oh my God. <laughs> no, I don't want to finish. <laughs> I don't want to. I'm bored. I'm bored now. This... I'm projecting a lot onto Doug Lyman because oh, I've just we're, known. We're going to keep going here. Someone else can finish it for me. Yeah. I, just, I just need the listeners to know that I've just known so many people like this. I gave you a quote that you're going to love <sighs> here coming That's up. But, okay, this so is Frank outraged. Marshall about working with Lyman on Born Identity was such a pain. I stepped into territory I've never been in before in 30 years. I've always had a respect for the line between a producer and a director, and I had to step over that line into something that I feel is the director's responsibility. I'm not saying I directed the movie, but as the producer, it was my job to get the movie finished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and that's very hard when you're dealing with Doug Lyman, who constantly changes his mind. Who's apparently also a giant man baby. Yeah, <laughs> and he, he's brilliant. 
or indecisive. We can't. We don't remember. <laughs> Um, at the end of the day, Lyman does admit that the final film was a collaborative effort with Frank Marshall, mm. but this is, what, <laughs> this is what he had to say about that, Ray. At the end of the day, look at Congo and look at my movies and let an audience figure out where that movie came from. <laughs> Boo. Wow. <laughs> he does not give a shit. <laughs> And so, and uh, one more quote, Jenny Ray. This is this one I had to pull just for you. This is the line producer, Patrick Crowley, who worked on Born Identity. Oh, my God. Line producers, bless their souls. These people, these are these are the people that put up with the most bullshit, I will tell you right now. So I'm excited to see what this guy has to say. He's created this personality where he doesn't have to do the planning or make decisions or be responsible. <laughs> I I felt that like Ray's whole body was just like shaking with like anger and like I felt that in this room. Yeah. 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 That kind of type. Okay. Wow. Yes. So this is okay. He's like again, like I was saying, I don't have to know things or like be places on time or like care about permits because I'm just there for like the vision of the movie, man. <laughs> I'm Doug fucking I'm Lyman. Doug yeah. fucking Lyman. So, so throughout um, Born Identity or all his movies, he likes to say he likes to find the film oh, okay. while he's making it. Oh but my he God, was very... what is he? What do you think he is? Like fucking uh, Michelangelo <laughs> yeah. carving David out of marble? Yeah. I like to find Fine. the movie. The movie's in there. I just have to find it. I have, I have to, to chisel it away at it. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he was very notorious for um, being like having the crew set up uh, one scene, like a whole shot, and then be there and go, Yeah, I don't want to do this scene right now. Let's do something else. Like, wow. My and God. constant delays and stuff like that. And that that is literally a producer's worst nightmare. Like every every producer is just like, No. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. So, okay. So this is from the LA Times. Again. I think that's called directile dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'll do my my pharmaceutical. If you suffer from directile dysfunction, contact your doctor immediately. Fire him and fire new. Please consult your producer. <laughs> okay, Please consult your producer. Okay, so this is the LA Times to kind of round out uh, his personality. <laughs> Those who've worked with him talk about his thousand yard stare, a gaze that suggests Lyman is sometimes not quite present. Although many in Hollywood have speculated about the exact nature of Lyman's process, Lyman says he's never been told that there's anything unusual about the way his mind works. But he knows there was something out of the ordinary about the way he worked during a flight he took from New York to Los Angeles when he was preparing to pitch the idea for the Born Identity. On that trip, he says he wore two sets of headphones so he could simultaneously watch The Horse Whisperer and The Wedding Singer, at the same time, he reread the Robert Ludlum novel of The Born Identity. And the last thing I'll say about uh, Lyman is he says, one way or another, I always get my way. <laughs> so yeah. he's still kind of a spoiled rich kid, right? Yeah. Like yeah. he has that in him. Right. I'm looking at his face here on, on, <laughs> on IMDb and he does, he does have like resting spoiled rich kid face. <laughs> um. To me, it more just sounds like he's he's adopted this mythos of like the male genius, like yeah, where, absolutely right. Where it's like it doesn't like I don't have to try because I'm just naturally good at this. And unfortunately, like most of the movies that he's made have been, I think, like pretty good movies or yes. like considered good movies. Yes, and so that's just kind of proving out that point, right? Where he's just like. Yeah, I'm a pain in the ass to work with. Everyone has to pick up after me and like make sure I get my homework in on time and like parent me as an adult man working on a film set. <laughs> However, the movies turn out great. And like even if the movies turn out great because of the collective work of every single person on that film or whatever producer had to come in and like organize and wrangle that chaos, he's going to just be like like that quote where he's just like, "Yeah, but did you see Congo? That movie was shit. My movie yeah, was good." Right. Like, yeah, and yeah, so you did jumper, dude. All right, don't. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like I just, I just feel like there's a lot of people in Hollywood who have that. They're just like, I can be 
my an method. absolute horrible bullshit person to work with. Yeah. And you all have to put up with it because I'm a goddamn genius. Yeah. And it, the uh, ends justified my means. Yeah. Can we like not with that anymore? <laughs> like I'm so yeah. over it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that a lot of those stories kind of get out now. And so that people really have to learn. Yeah. Okay. That's the setup for Doug Lyman. Now, the other thing we need to do to set up for this movie is like Surviving Christmas and like the Benefer drama. We are not a gossip podcast, but it's important <laughs> to know going into Mr. and Mrs. Smith about all the publicity drama of the relationship between Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, a.k.a. Brangelina. That's right. Um, do people still do those portmanteau celebrity names? Oh, yeah. Or did that die? No, that's still a thing. Okay. Whether or not it gains that much traction. Yeah. But. Um, Ian and I are collectively clean. <laughs> clean. <laughs> Says you. <laughs> We're int. R- rent? Rent? <laughs> rent. So Brad Pitt dated Gwyneth Paltrow in the mid 90s, and that was like a big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they broke up, and then he married Jennifer Aniston in 2000, and they split in January of 2005. Okay. okay. So let's remember that beginning of 2005. That's your setup. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, written by Simon Kinberg, who we've mentioned multiple times in this. Uh, he at, th- at this point, he only done a lot of uncredited rewrites on a bunch of movies, and his only uh, official credit was the second Triple X movie, State of the Union. Um, <laughs> but then he went on to make all kinds of things in X-Men, Last Stand, <laughs> and The Dark Phoenix we've talked about. He did The Dark oh, Phoenix. Oh, that's right. He did two, <laughs> two Dark, Dark Phoenix films. <laughs> And, <laughs> and <laughs> they both suck. Yes. So uh, Nicole Kidman was initially cast first. So she was Mrs. D- or Jane Smith. Um, and then she asked Brad Pitt to join her. Hmm. So it was going to be those two. Whatever random contract that Brad Pitt had when he was brought on board, but he had director approval for the film. Um, and so... They went to John Woo, David Fincher, Michael Mann, Guy Ritchie. Oh, wow. These were all considered. But Pitt was was like, I remember Doug Lyman. Brad Pitt was originally cast as Jason Bourne, and he was on that project for a little while, and he met with Doug Lyman, and he kind of liked his- His manic chaos <laughs> brain. The manic he loved, chaos. He loved whatever persona he <laughs> yeah. was-, uh, was per- 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 Yeah, he was- <laughs> Portraying yeah. at the time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing about people like that is like they can be very charismatic. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so, so he was like, he was surprising. very impressed by Lyman. And he was like, okay, like I'll remember this guy uh, going forward. Um, and then Lyman was kicked off the Bourne sequel. Uh, they were like Universal was like, we're never making a movie with this guy. Oh, no, yeah. They're like, mm-hmm. and, um, and so he assumed his career was over. Uh, <laughs> Let's be honest. Lyman didn't really assume that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so then Brad Pitt was like, goes to 20th Century Fox, and they were like, I actually, this is kind of cool. Like, um, he, they were excited to work with this guy that did the Born Identity, which was a bigger hit than anybody thought it would ever be. And um, as the first first day of filming came up, what happens? Uh, Kidman drops out. Exactly. That was <laughs> cool. Right. Good guess. Uh, Damn. Kidman's, I was like, Nicole I don't know. Kidman's uh, Stepford wives went over schedule, and so she had to drop out. Ah. Oh, okay. And so um, after she dropped out, what happened? Uh, Pitt dropped out. Stop reading my notes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> yes, Brad Pitt also dropped out. That's funny because Pitt's like, well, bring in. Bring in Doug Lyman, and then Doug Lyman yeah, comes out. out, and he's like, oh, I <laughs> yeah. see you. Oh, and he's uh, just like, oh, Nicole Kidman's not going to be there? Yeah. So Lyman went to Will Smith and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Okay. That didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Then he considered Johnny Depp and Kate Blanchett, which I think is kind of an interesting one. That would be, that's a that's a very interesting combo. That would be an extremely different movie. Right, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very different. Um, then <laughs> Jack Brad... Sparrow and Gladriel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Then uh, Brad Pitt came back. His, something changed. I don't know what. But he came back. So Lyman had the great idea of casting him opposite of who? Jennifer Aniston. Oh, he's, he was still married to her. To Angelina Jolie? 
No? Oh, Gwyneth Paltrow? <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh. Oh, that's funny. Oh, because he's like, it's about a married couple that's fighting. That's yes. going to be hilarious. This is Doug Lyman yeah. on that choice. He's like, I'm going to bring this real world chaos to my set because I love chaos. <laughs> chaos agent. Think of the spectacle of that. Fireworks could really fly in that situation because I'm sure there's some shit one of them was mad at the other for. You find out what that baggage is and bring it out at the right moment with the camera rolling. My producers were like, look, that's a great idea. But Brad is a human being. Even if he was game for it, it's wrong for us to put him in a situation where he's going to have to relive the demons of a relationship. That's just a little bit too mad scientist. Yeah, that's like, me- that is, that's method directing right there. That is, hey, it movie, really, it really is. This movie is about a couple who are literally fighting <laughs> with, yeah. with guns and weapons. Yeah. Let's get somebody who Brad has fought with before on an emotional level. Right. Let's get, wait, so, so this was what, this was what year? This was in. This is 2004. Okay, so he was like squarely divorced from Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, just split. I don't think they got married. But... Oh, okay. Squarely split from her yeah. with Jennifer Aniston. Yes. And he's like, Mwah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> yeah. Mm, let's bring that chaos into the room. <laughs> <laughs> let's bring the chaos. chaos. It's just... <laughs> <What a> psychopath. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> The irony that and one of his... every single like, and you know how horrible and awkward that would have been for every single fucking other person and actor oh, in the movie. Right? <laughs> <sighs> the other thing that wouldn't, that possibly might not have worked, is that like part of the fun of Mister and Mrs. Smith is that they're like trying to kill each other, but then they also like really, like still love each other. Well, that's what would be really kind of funny because like, like if you did that you with need those that two, chemistry that yeah. like maybe they were just like. I fucking God damn hate it. Ugh, you bitch. Yeah. Let's hate fuck. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. I can't yeah. even pretend to be sexy mad at him because <laughs> I'm just regular mad at him. Um, okay. So Angelina Jolie was a rising star and then therefore was chosen. Uh, the film was initially greenlit at a hundred million dollars, uh, which is a huge step up. Um, There's a hundred million dollars in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't, get, don't get me wrong. I, I enjoyed watching the movie. Oh, yeah, this was fun. I enjoyed watching it. It was fun. It, but it like, was the you, house. Yeah. The house was $100 yeah, yeah, million. Yeah, right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you said the $100 million. Oh. Uh, where? Yeah, we're going to get around to that. Um, <laughs> so Doug Lyman um, had writer Simon Kinberg write 30 to 40 different versions of the ending. So... On Born Identity, this is something that <laughs> just Tony... so that he had every possible option for y- exactly. how he felt on it's that the day. It's the chaos. It's the chaos yes, he loves, right? Yeah. So this is exactly what Tony Gilroy had to deal with when he was doing Born Identity. So Gilroy, Rogue One, and or right. And oh, he, he was... wrote Born Identity. Yeah, okay. he he did the majority of it. So um, and he was just like every time, like Lyman would be like, "Hey, uh, let's try this. Let's try this," and just constantly throw ideas. And Gilroy. Gilroy hated it because he was like, I, Lug, Doug Lyman has no concept of story structure. And so he's mm-hmm. like, so if you change something, this should have a cause and effect to the, the script later on. And he's like, he, he, Lyman doesn't understand that. What and, if uh, Jason finds out who he is in the beginning? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so then, so Tony would be like, okay, so he would struggle with it and then figure out how to write it. And then he would send in the new pages. And then by the time that he got the pages, Lyman was like, eh, you know what? We were right the first time. Oh, that's so annoying. Oh, my and God. So, oh, it's so annoying. So ultimately, Lyman for Mrs. Dermott's Mrs. Smith, all those different versions of the ending went with the original version of that Simon Kingberg wrote. Of course wrote. he did. <laughs> kind of. We'll get to the ending okay. at the end. So they started January 2004 and didn't finish until April of 2005. Filming? Filming. Wow. (laughs) Okay. So middle of that, Brad Pitt left the film for three months in the summer to go shoot Ocean's 12. (laughs) (laughs) So Just like took a sabbatical. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. So Lyman was betting that the film, that Ocean's 12 wouldn't be ready in time. Mm -hmm. And... And uh, he was wrong. The irony is this is the exact same thing that happened on Born Identity, where he was like, oh, I have Matt Damon for as long as I got. Nope. That film had almost finished. And Matt Damon had to leave and do Oceans 11. Uh, <laughs> so, uh. so as Lyman says, he's like, I keep betting against Steven Soderbergh and losing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, never yeah, bet you... against Steven Soderbergh. <laughs> How dare you? You never bet against a movie that is... 
like that takes place in Vegas. You don't bet <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. against Vegas movies. And a director that has his shit together. Yeah, shit yeah. together, right? <laughs> So, uh, but, but even that is like so egotistical. It's like, yeah, I have Matt Damon for as long as I want him. He's like, what the hell else is he going to do? It's like, Matt Damon is a huge ass movie star, my dude. Yeah, yeah. He, is, he is an actor. Like, he is, he is universally loved by everybody. Yeah. Like, oh, come on. No, no, I like, oh, I, 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 yeah. I love Matt Damon. Um, but the, the internet goes back and forth on him. Hmm. Well, the um, internet is, what is yeah, the, the internet worst, now? The worst. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so production on Mr. and Smith, Mrs. Smith had a pickup back in the fall. Throughout production, Brad Pitt, so let's kind of go back, remind ourselves, at this time was one of the biggest stars on the planet. Oh, yeah. Like, he was huge. This is prime Pitt. Yes. Prime Pitt era. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he was rumoredly on the rocks with Jennifer Aniston. And now he was doing a movie with Hollywood's new sex pot, Angelina Jolie. Oh, yeah. The person, and if you guys remember back then, Jolie was so like, oh, it's like everything, every, every interview was like fucking crazy. Like she was always just so sexual and trying to make people embarrassed and just telling these weird stories. Like when she was um, married to uh, Billy Bob, Bob Thornton and oh, they were like, yeah. what's the craziest yeah, moment? And they're like, oh, yeah. probably having sex on the way over to this premiere and stuff. Like they were, con- she was constantly like that. They're just like pushing the boundaries. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. I remember it's... her and her Billy Bob time. That yeah. Was... They carried around a, a vial oh, yeah. of each other's blood. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. She was, she was like all about like pushing that right. that button and so now she's in in a movie with the biggest star um who right. might be going through relationships issues so let paparazzi the, let the rumors begin yes paparazzi were everywhere around this film mm-hmm. this set um yeah. to the point they had problems with helicopters flying around their sets wow. Jesus. like just following the stars and stuff um oh those oh, sound God. guys those sound guys were so <laughs> mad yeah. those fucking sound guys were just like hold hold for a helicopter yeah right. with their eyes twitching now, I know, just yeah. fucking pissed now i know this is hypocritical because i mean i'm interested in celebrities lives but like right. who the fuck cares yeah. oh, i know and it, it's and it's all so they can get that one shot that they can sell for a million dollars it's yeah it's so stupid so because of that, you're right. The rumor mill is insane during this movie. Right. Um, they were such a problem that that anything taking place outside had them swarming the area, which would ruin shots. And so it got to the point they started changing shooting locations to attempt to throw the press to be like, oh, like oh, we're supposed to be shooting here. Actually, we're shooting over here or uh, avoiding giving them early access. So like one location they they set up, this was early on, they, they realized it was across the street from a hotel. Mm. And then they were like, well, shit, they're just going to rent the rooms. And just be all up in there, sitting there taking photos with yeah. their like giant lenses, <laughs> yeah. their like four foot long camera <laughs> yeah. lenses. And, and um, so one of the producers was like, "God damn it!" So he rented a crane just to put in the line of sight of the hotel. Yeah, and then some... and then Lyman got on set and was just like, "Why the fuck is there a crane in my shot?" Yeah. So they had to digitally remove the crane. That's wow. where the hundred million dollars went. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Paparazzi like, crowd control. Not only do we have to rent a crane, but now we have to pay to have that fucker digitally removed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, anything spoken on the radio had to be very direct and very accurately said. So um, mm. there was no room for imp- interpretation. So there was one moment where um, they were setting up a between shots and uh, Pitt and Jolie were just off the side and they were playing ping pong. Uh-huh. And um, someone was at, went on the radio was like, where are Pitt and Jolie? And the, the assistant just goes, oh, they're screwing around over here. And the and the oh, lineman was no. like, no 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 no, you can't say things like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> like, just fucking around. They're, yeah, they're playing with balls. I mean, they're they're ping ponging. I mean, they're, they're knocking, I mean, they've got the, their paddles out. I she's mean, playing shit. with his balls. I mean, I mean yeah, they're knocking balls around. <laughs> they're they're just they're fucking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Every possible word is sexual. Yeah. So, all that kind of stuff, no matter what it was. Went into the tabloids. Mm. So this is some of Brad this. Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie play ping pong. 
naked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Just With add that ball. little spicy detail. Strip ping pong. <laughs> it was just a regular game of ping pong. Oh my God, if I play strip ping pong, I would be naked so quick. I <laughs> yeah. suck at that game. Same. You're also very, wearing very little clothing. Yeah. That's true. I know. I just wear a loincloth when I play ping pong. That's really all I play with. Oh, do you have anything for Clint's Closet today? I do. Uh, are we going to talk about Adam Brody at all? No, not at all. Okay, well, I'll Go just ahead. get it out right. Okay, so Adam, <laughs> I had, I had, I had nothing. I had nothing to connect this to this film, right? But I was like, oh, wait, Adam. <laughs> but listen, Adam Brody is in this, so that I could have gone one of two Big ways. Big OC fan. Well, he was in Gilmore Girls, <laughs> and I love the Gilmore Girls, and so I tried my hardest to find my Luke's Diner T-shirt. I couldn't find it, but then I remembered. Wait, he was also in Scream Four, which I love the Scream movies. So I have my. My ghost face plush. Oh, <laughs> ghost face. Oh, it's so it's cute. Nothing to do with anything. <laughs> it's nothing to do with anything about anything. But Adam Brody was in Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Adam Brody was in Scream 4. Yeah. I love Scream. This is my ghost face plushie. <laughs> I mean, so I know it's not possible for one person to have collectibles from every yeah, conceivable yeah, sure. movie in existence, but I have to say I'm pretty disappointed in the closet lately. Yeah. Oh, the fuck, Ray! What do you got? I, th- I thought for sure it was going to be uh, Tomb Raider, something. I don't, I don't have anything Tomb Raider. Mm. No, I mean, I, I guess know. I could have grabbed my son's bow and arrow. <laughs> He's, and hunted you guys. Yeah. No, well, we will accept the ghost face yeah. plushie for Adam Brady. And, and, and look, like who's in this have... movie for five minutes? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's so and weird. he's he's in Scream. Like he has like the like the one of the lamest deaths in Scream. Also, so it's just like all right, whatever. <laughs> okay. So back to the 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 tabloids. So this is some of the bullshit that just like came out as, oh, this is what was happening on set. Yeah. Uh, Jolie deliberately did a move during their tango where she came face to face with Pitt's crotch. That's scripted. That was in the fucking movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it was deliberate because <laughs> yeah. it's in right. the script. But like, I'm sure, like via. Blankety blank rumor mill. By the time it got to the f- fifth person, she did what? what? Oh, yeah. type it up. Uh, during their fight sex scene, uh, Jolie <laughs> didn't wear any panties to surprise Pitt. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, that the sex scene was so hot, they had to be. It had to be trimmed down so it wasn't red at R. Whoa, R. <laughs> <laughs> Just... No, I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, unless it was going to be rated X, I'm not interested. <laughs> yeah. 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 Seriously. Um, so, speaking of the filming, uh, filming the sex scene. So, um, this is this is where this the kind of I go into the the awkwardness of Lyman. <laughs> and oh God! Is I'm scared. He, his most the thing he was the most worried about on Born Identity was the scene where they make out. Not the. Not the fight scenes, not taking on $60 million. The scene where they 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 kiss was yeah. the one thing he dreaded the most. Oh, oh my God. They're, <laughs> they're human contact. <laughs> lips are going to touch. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's surprising to hear because there's a lot of great sexual chemistry in this movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, but so his biggest worry was their sex scene. Ah, of course. So yeah. going into it. Um, so he thought he'd, uh, this is oh, him. No. He was. He was like, "I'm gonna try to break the ice no. on the awkwardness no. of filming this sex scene." And so this is Doug Lyman. Oh no, I hate <laughs> it. Okay, what did he say? I had an ex-girlfriend who'd given me the nickname Bunny, and I said, "I'm sure Angie that you've had cute names like that for your boyfriends." And Brad, I'm sure you've had girlfriends who called you, you know, little mushroom or walnut or my little scrubby wubby. <laughs> I honestly thought everybody does this, and they were like, "Uh, no." So I was left there naked. It wasn't a bonding experience at all. I lost all sexual credibility with Angie on the spot. She called me Bunny from then on. She never let me forget. Oh my God, that is amazing. Yeah. Wait, did he come in there and talk to them and tell them this while he was naked? Yeah, was he actually? <laughs> He's like, look, guys. Yeah, I'm breaking the ice, just, guys. <laughs> just, just gonna break the ice a little bit here. You know, just like, just we're just gonna let it all hang out. If we all see each other naked, if the crew's all naked too, all we see, it's not gonna be weird for anybody because cool. we're all naked. Let me introduce you to Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> little Bunny. What, also, but like, what are those fucking nicknames? Like he, like the one, I, well, the random you know, examples funny, that he came like, up. I, I think that's funny because at the same time, it's like absolutely real couples have <laughs> oh, little yeah. names oh, yeah. for each other, and it's like 
like celebrities don't yeah oh no I think they're better uh, than celebrities us. they're just like us <laughs> except they don't have nicknames apparently yeah <laughs> Um, so I think like his his <laughs> idea was maybe on the mark, but like his I'm gonna, execution. <laughs> I'm gonna tell Lisa to call me her little scrubby wubby little from now on. Um, a little mushroom, <laughs> little mushroom <laughs> head. <laughs> oh my god! What was he suggesting though? Was he suggesting that they like use those cutesy nicknames for each other just to make it yeah, feel yeah, less the, yeah, weird? Yeah, to like to make it less awkward. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. And then he just made it more. And then awkward. he just made, and then they the were just like, is, what like, the fuck? They're, they're both professionals. Who yeah. Both are very charismatic right. and like mm-hmm. s- sexually attractive people. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like like objectively, yeah, attractive people. Yeah. Like they're. They're not they're worried gonna at all. They're going to be fine. Yeah, they're they're going to be just they're, fine. They're, like, they're, 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 they're actors. It's yeah. their job. Okay, so calling uh, Jolie calling Lyman Bunny, this gave rise to this rumor. Like, And she did it throughout the rest of the production. Yeah. It, it's kind of affectionate. That's right? just, yeah. Like, and, just funny. Yeah. yeah. So Yeah, we'll, um, we'll take it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll take it again, Bunny. We'll do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Right? So <laughs> uh, this gave rise to a rumor that she hated working with Lyman. Oh. And then Pitt was their intermediary. Which in turn gave rumors to that's why they fell in love on the set Ooh. was because he was just like, calm down, Jolie, I'll take care of it. It couldn't Who just the be, fuck knows. It right. could just be what something happens? as simple as Brad and Jennifer Aniston were having troubles, <laughs> and then and then and they just and then Brad and Angelina just had like some good chemistry. Yeah, like, it couldn't just be yeah, something as simple exactly. as that. And then two of the sexiest people on the planet were put together <laughs> in very close contact for more than a year. Yeah. 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 Where it's she had, not that she had surprising. to sit there and look at his little mushroom. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Lyman says he never caught wind of their romance, which is not surprising. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> considering the person we're talking about. Well, I mean, they didn't give each other nicknames, so I don't <laughs> yeah. think they didn't think they really liked oh, each they other. Hate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't give each other cute um, nicknames. They hated each other. <laughs> they were both very professional on set, and Lyman was uh, pressured consistently by the producers throughout to not play too much into the press hands and just in case the film alienates Jennifer Aniston fans who would see the movie. Yeah. And it was like, who gives a shit? The script is the script. Like, it's like there's going to be a moment where he's all like, hmm, and I stand this situation. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay. As for Lyman, um, Kinberg, Simon Kinberg calls Lyman's filmmaking style affectionately as Limania. Oh, Limania. This, okay. This term gets published everywhere. Okay. That this this production has gone out of control Mania. and the, like mm-hmm. and the the stars don't care about it. They're just having sex and. Uh, because got, the director's got, not paying attention. You and... got PAs doing lines of coke in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, chaos uh, yeah, off of off of the the ping pong table. <laughs> the two yeah. by four. <laughs> the um, director. Got... <laughs> yeah. Um, Lyman said that on a daily basis, he struggled with how much of the film would be a comedy versus an action film. As he says, he's trying to find the film. Right. Mm. Um, the script was much funnier and broader than what we, we see in the final product. Um, because Lyman would didn't like when he some of the lines were delivered by Pitt and Jolie. Not because of their delivery by any means, but it was just like, would these particular characters, these these very gorgeous people say something that goofy? Oh, like they're like, too hot to be funny? Yeah, or something like- <laughs> That's something I struggle with every day. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what were the lines? Like, Brad Pitt walks into the living room. He's like, waka waka. Like, well, what were the yeah. lines? So, like, one of them one of them was, like, he hits her over the head with, a, like, one, his golfing trophy. And mm-hmm. then his, his, like, makes some weird, like, he's like, well, I guess I'll uh, have to win this again next year. Like, it was, like, too oh. broad. Like, yeah, and yeah, it just yeah. didn't yeah. work. So, if it was, like, a movie, uh, in, instead of two of the hottest people, if it was, like, I don't know, Zach Galifianakis or something like saying that line. That makes much more sense, sure, right? Sure, sure. So, so Lyman didn't like how some of that was working. You know, I can kind of get that because there's that line in the movie where he goes, come to daddy. And then she like kicks him and she goes, who's your daddy now? And I'm like, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I definitely felt like. I mean, the thing is, though, is that when you look at Brad Pitt now, like he's re- he does comedy roles all the time. He's really funny. Yeah, like, yeah, but he's it's like just in like Bullet it's... Train and his role in Lost he's... City was 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 funny. Yeah. yeah, so so just like it's just 
Yeah, it's whatever the style of that particular film that you're mm. trying to make, whether that works for yeah. it, right? Mm. And so he was struggling with that, regardless of whether we think his decision was right or whatever. Right. That's what he was struggling with. <laughs> um, an infamous story uh, started making the rounds about Lyman telling Pitt that he wasn't putting enough emotion into the to a scene, and he, he started getting really frustrated with Pitt. The problem was Pitt was really annoyed. <laughs> Because the camera was pointed at someone else and you only saw the back of Pitt's head. <laughs> so during oh. that scene, Pitt was like, what does it fucking matter? You if... can't even see my face. Yeah. So it's all I about the other person. literally be a stand-in right now. In fact, yeah. can you bring my stand-in here? <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is, Lyman was asked about this and he's like, I don't remember this happening. But then he says, I may have been wanting to get more emotion from the back of his head. I probably succeeded. What the fuck does that mean? Oh my god. Head acting. <laughs> Brad Pitt's a great head actor. <laughs> so, producer Lucas Foster says of Lyman, he's elliptical in his thinking. But he says like Lucas Foster says like it doesn't when you're talking to him and he's explaining this, it doesn't make sense. He's mm. like, you're like, what is he talking about? And then it like works. So he's talking <sighs> about like, he's like that that moment in where Pitt wasn't giving enough to the back of his head. Like he's like, but that <laughs> shot is in the movie. So like, did did it work? And so he's just like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> so like, was the required emotion from his head, and like, what was needed to make the other person, yeah, have exactly. their best performance? God yeah. damn it, that's so annoying. Yeah. Right. Where you're just like, God damn it, was he right? Shit, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, speak. Lucas Foster is the Lyman Wrangler <laughs> for <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Smith. That's the movie version of Horse Whisperer and Wedding Singer. The <laughs> yeah. Lyman Wrangler. <laughs> yeah. Wait, this and this guy's role was what? Uh, regular producer. During Born Identity, this is going to get you even more, Jenny Ray. <laughs> Jog Lyman didn't care about wide shots. And so, so the actors would just sit there and wander around and do their own blocking and for a scene. And then he only cared about close-ups, like the back of their heads, right? And that's what he would, when they were, they were doing their close-ups, that's when he would sit there and give them all the notes about their acting and stuff like right. this. What's the problem with that? Well, then none of the close-ups match the wide. Because exactly. you have to have consistent blocking. Exactly. So this caused a horrible continuity issues when editing. It. Is that why that movie is so fucking breakneck? Like... <laughs> on speed because it's just like um, cut, 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 cut. Between Mr. Close and Mrs. Smith? No, no, no. Sorry. You said born identity. Born identity. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is just cutting between close-ups constantly because they were like, <laughs> listen, none of these wide shots are usable because like the actors were doing fuck all because they didn't know what to actually, do. Actually, you might, you, you, you would need to see born identity again. It does have this retroactive effect because um, definitely the, the two sequels have uh, invented the shaky cam style, but that mm. really wasn't apparent in the first one. If you oh, watch okay. the first I'm one, it doesn't the... have that. Okay. But regardless, any scene you have and people are just wandering around on set and then you punch into a close up, they need to be standing where the fuck they are supposed to be standing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> some editor was so mad. Yes. Absolutely, See, he is, was. <laughs> this is why I get. This is why I get so fired up about people like this. Is because I just think about like every single other person. That's who, to clean up the mess. Who worked on that movie? Who is just like I'm having a bad time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having the worst time. What, yes. what did he give me? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, what do you yeah. want me to do with this? So this is Lucas Foster about that knowing that particular thing about Doug Lyman. We all did our homework before on Doug. There wasn't a situation where we didn't have coverage because I would stand on the set and get the coverage. I'd say, we're shooting that shot. The good thing about Doug is he is okay with that. So basically, he's like, oh, he heard all those stories and all the problems they had. And he was like, okay, so I got to make sure that Doug gets these fucking shots correctly so that it doesn't become an editing nightmare. Yeah. Again, being a bomb ass producer <laughs> doing his fucking job. Um, did they all just get like a dossier before the movie on Lyman? Just like <laughs> yeah. a Lyman. Like, all right, everybody, before we start this movie, we've got to brief you on Lyman. <laughs> Listen, everybody, I'm calling a full a full crew meeting here. We got to talk about Doug. <laughs> that, that would absolutely. Honestly, be I worked a scene. on some. I've worked on some stuff where getting a heads up would have been awful nice. <laughs> 
this that I could see that scene playing out. Okay, so he doesn't seem to like he he he's almost like he never pays attention. Um, we have to make sure he gets certain things done. Uh, he's okay with me if you tell him these things because he's just not thinking about it. We just have to handhold him. Yeah. And then the camera punches out a little bit. You okay with that, Doug? Doug? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Oh, yeah good. <laughs> anyway, I was thinking, Brad. Uh, I was thinking, Brad. We we need to do that. Redo those close ups. Your head was not acting nearly <laughs> enough. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay. I'm gonna. That's I'm guys. Okay. That's gonna be okay, everybody. <laughs> okay. So uh, you, know that, you know that point in Dragon Ball Z before they like power up and they go like real Super Saiyan. Like mm-hmm. there's like those white lines that are happening. That's what Ray's yeah. got going on right now. I'm gonna go so Super Saiyan right now. <laughs> Um, and play into the kind of idea that he's like, okay, like constantly evolving the idea. Uh, Vince Vaughn was meant to be a cameo. Now, I can't really figure out what that was originally supposed to be. Someone said something like his only scene was when he goes to uh, his house mm. for the first time. And he's like, he's like, you live with your mom. Yeah, because she's the only one I like. I trust. I trust like, right. like um, from what I was gathering that maybe that was the only scene that Vince Vaughn was supposed to be in, mm. Mm. which I don't like when you're sitting there and deconstruct the film. Like, I don't know how that makes a lot of sense, but that his was supposed to be a cameo. But as filming went on, they were like, oh, we need to we need to put Vince Vaughn more into this because Lyman was like, oh, yeah, these are good. This is good. Like, yeah, let's yeah, let's change this. And so. So it's again, it's that cause and effect thing that Tony Gilroy was talking about. It's like you can't just suddenly add more scenes. Like it has to make sense. So I'm sure, like having a break with uh, Brad Pitt being gone for a couple of months, like they kind of figured some of that out. But um, yeah, he, Vince Vaughn was only supposed to be in one scene. Uh, the desert scene was originally scripted in the mountains, and they shot for four days. Doing this sequence before Lyman decided he didn't like it. Mm. <laughs> the one of like three scenes with Adam Brody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kinda, yeah. One of three scenes with Adam Brody. Oh, look, more mountains. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then they were, he was like, I don't like it. Like, and so then they had to retrofit their, their scheduling to go like, well, shit, now we got to find a different location and get all the sets and, and whatever. Get all and the figure... permits, wrangle all the vehicles, yes. get everybody there. Like, it's a ton of work when you change your mind last yeah. minute. Yeah, for a $100 million pr- production, that means just like that's a lot of people doing... Tearing their hair out <laughs> to accommodate <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can't yeah. just pivot like that. Right. So, um, studio let that happen. So, um, in the middle of shooting... It's decided they need a more experienced second unit director. So second unit's usually just action stuff that doesn't involve actors, right? So they brought in Simon Crane, who worked on the Lara Croft movies and with Julie and Troy with Brad Pitt. So normally second unit doesn't deal with actors, but they needed him to do the action scenes with Pitt and Jolie because they were so kind of intertwined. Mm. Like it wasn't just mm. like an action scenes between two random people, like because it constantly goes back and forth between an action moment, a comedy moment. So you kind of have to have them doing the same time. So because of this, dire- uh, Crane was there directing the actors for these scenes. Um, and this started a big rumor that Crane took over directing. Hmm. So in reality, it was because Lyman was too unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lucas Foster about uh, bringing on Simon Crane. Doug's desire to change things at last minute was not okay when you're shooting a big stunt. That was just a non-starter. Doug lost his right to comment on changes. Once we did the rigging of the set, it, that was it. He stood there with me and Akiva and watched Simon do his thing. Huh. So he's just like, because he was just like, mm, you know, I don't like that. Blah, blah. And it's like, no, Doug, no. We're, no. we're this is set. <laughs> we're yeah. doing this. That's why he probably worked so well in like an independent environment because like, Though that shit is constant chaos and no one cares about safety. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, yeah. yeah. And you have you have five people on set, yeah. right? So he just did that one scene or he did all of the action scenes? No, he did most of the action stuff. So then what the fuck else did Doug Lyman direct? <laughs> Brad Pitt's head? <laughs> Those dinner scenes. <laughs> the every, scenes of them eating dinner? Every dinner scene and every scene <laughs> with uh, Vince Vaughn because Vince Vaughn's his buddy. Yeah. <laughs> No, like um, I'm trying to think of like what even else there is around those big action like set I'm, pieces. I'm assuming at that point it got to it got to a, a 
thing where they were both just there for all the action and yeah. it was almost co-directed by the guy <laughs> yeah because like you said second unit is usually just like oh we need some like we, we need some big like wide shots or like crowd shots so can you just go grab like these these random little extra bits that we need for this movie but if you yeah. directed every single action scene with I, don't, the I don't know about actors, every single one but like a lot of a lot them. of them okay yeah. so uh during the big house ambush originally a random soldier one of those random goons throws a grenade through the window that triggers the big house explosion. Mm -hmm. Lyman hated it. He's sitting there looking at the, the cut and he's just like, so stupid. And so he wanted to do something else, but they had already detonated the scale model of the home. It was like a, a one third scale <laughs> model that they already blew up. And he was like, I want to redo it all. And <laughs> they're like, no, stop hemorrhaging money. Yeah. Um, and Fox refused to fund a new sequence. So Lyman, like he does, goes rogue. He went into his mom's garage, built a fake stairwell, and borrowed a robot from iRobot, put a bunch of random shit on it, <laughs> like kit bashed it, and shot that grenade dropper on his own. You know, that little that robot yeah. that just shows up and then drops the grenade. <laughs> like that's what was the like the change it needed. <laughs> I don't even, I mean, now that you said that, I remember it, but I was just like, oh, yeah, like, how did that grenade get in the house? Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a like, fucking robot. <laughs> it's inconsequential of how a fucking grenade gets into a house. And also doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I know. Does it really, like, the difference between someone throwing it in versus a robot dropping it, it still has the exact same outcome. outcome. Well, here's the thing, though. Like, think about it this way. Like, you're a soldier, right? Like. All right, guys, we need to have the element of surprise here. What should we do? Should we throw a grenade in real quick? No, let's get a robot and have it slowly go in there <laughs> yeah. and drop a grenade down. Yeah. Just all, and all it does is Beep. drop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like it. Let's take our time with this. Let's really <laughs> give them time to fight back instead of just throwing a grenade. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's, the, the, that's the thing that L Lyman thinks is... That will change the film. It was right? so forgettable because when you said, "Yeah, a soldier throws a grenade in the window," I was like, "Oh yeah, that happened." I'm like, wait, 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 no, there was there was a robot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's so like blinking, you miss it. Yeah, too, right. And I remember thinking when I watched the movie, "Why the fuck is there a robot? <laughs> <laughs> Who's piloting that robot?" <laughs> yeah, it got in there pretty quick. And also, why did they have an enormous fuel tank in their in house? their basement? Cellar, yeah, that makes way less sense. <laughs> Yeah, where like they like kick it, like the grenade falls, and they're just like, "Oh, we gotta get this grenade away from us!" Blah, and they kick it, and then they both look over, and there's just a giant <laughs> tank that says "fuel" on the side, and it's like, for what? <laughs> for what? Why is it there? They have seven. They sets. have seven gas ranges in their house. <laughs> Seriously, going at, at all, all times. times. Yes, <laughs> for all those dinners she's cooking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that is nonsense. Okay, so the ending was always in constant flux. Like you said, he had him rewrite it 30 or 40 times. With the villains originally played by Jacqueline Bissett, who is in a bunch of random stuff, a lot of TV stuff, but she's also Mrs. Goodthighs in Casino Royale, <laughs> um, <laughs> and Terrence Stamp. Okay. Zod and a billion yeah, other things, yeah. right? Um, and the Smiths kill them at the end. So they're, they're their bosses, right? Are they in the movie? No. Uh, they were edited out and then recast with the voice of Angela Bassett mm -hmm. as Mr. Smith's boss and Keith David, who's seen for like half a second. Yeah, you see like <laughs> yeah. you see like half of his face. Yeah, yeah it, it through a monitor. So they they were completely replaced. By the way, his uh, so I don't know like what her spy institution is or whatever, <laughs> but like she seems to be the boss and she has all these other like hot girl like spies who work for her. But then, like, their boss, they called Father, which I thought was really upsetting. <laughs> she was like, Father wants to speak to you. Their and organization's I was like, called mm. Mother Box. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, it makes complete sense. <laughs> so there is an alternate ending you can find on YouTube. Um, and it has the Smiths in, like, uh, uh, some Latin American country. And they're sitting there like... <gasps> Where's the target? Where's the target? And they're like running around. And then they're like, there she is. And it's their child. And that's like just how it ends. It's kind of weird and kind mm -hmm. of like just kind of random. So one reshoot took place on in April of 2005 for a single day. And this was the new ending. I don't know what that means. 
I'm assuming that's the scene of them on the the uh, the therapist's office. Yeah, right. But like, did they is did they weave that through the movies? So yeah, they I don't end know. In, the, in therapy, I don't know because they, they, Simon they started the film with them in therapy. Yeah, and then they and, ended it. Yeah, with them in therapy. Yeah, so and that's got to be it. It must have just been those therapy scenes. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. But Simon Kinberg said that like his whole idea for this movie was learning about his uh, friends going to uh, relation or uh, couples, therapy. couples therapy. Oh, okay. And so like, did they shoot all of that stuff mm. so, all in one day? So yeah, what was the new ending? Yeah. But then if you think it's like that was one day of shooting all of that, I, I mean, that's would be pretty easy. Yeah. Cameras pretty, oh, yeah. pretty much in one spot. Right, Just one a room, couple ro- one ro- Wardrobe changes yeah. here and there. But that's literally like, <laughs> that's changing kind of like the thorough line of the entire movie because it's it's all talking about how their relationship kind of died and or yeah. was on the rocks and, and how it comes back. Like, it's kind of like the theme of the movie in a weird way. So it's like, right. that was li- added at the very last? And to be able to edit that in because the movie came out in June of June 10th. They shot this in April. So did the entire film change between that the two months? Hmm. Um the film went over budget by I'm going to say 50 million. I'm going to say 60 million. Guess Bob. really high, but it went 26 million mm. over ah, budget. Okay. So the film is 126 million. So that crane, that crane <laughs> like taking out those crane shots. <laughs> mhm. So one of the producers he w- mentioned earlier, me, uh, he says something about Akiva Goldsman. Jenny Ray, who's Ke- Akiva Goldsman? Um. Oh man, we just talked about this, and you told me, and I don't remember. No. Oh, I don't remember. You should know that. who this person is, because they wrote Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> so this guy's a genius, obviously. Yeah. This guy's your golden god. <laughs> Fucking genius. Um. This is uh, producer Akiva Goldsman about Doug Lyman. Doug has driven me crazy with distraction and crazy with joy. The truth is, Doug is a madman, but I think he has the ability, which is not insignificant, to have a movie coalesce around him. Actors want to work with him, and studios want the product that exists with his name on it. <sighs> I just, I don't know. I mean, is this a, a case of brilliance or someone failing upwards because everybody else is doing their their heavy lifting to fix all the other problems? Like, <laughs> you're never gonna totally know, I think, because there are prob- there probably were days where every single person on that set was just like, "Oh my god, I cannot deal with this guy for one more mm-hmm. fucking second. And then, like the next day, you probably showed up and like everything was great and like it worked really well. And you're like, "Okay, okay, well, like things are things are fine. Like things are working out." And then the next day was like. Oh my god, this is a disaster, you know. And so you're like you're you're getting but the fact that even people cuz normally people in Hollywood are so political and they don't say anything, right? Cuz they're like they're don't trying to the tree. Yeah, yeah, they're like they're like I want to keep working. I don't want to rub anyone the wrong way. I don't want to burn any bridges. Um like most people are pretty buttoned up and they don't really like talk about bad experiences. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, cuz like you've been doing all this yeah. research all this time. So the fact that like upwards of what 20 people we've listed or whatever have been like yeah, he's a fucking nightmare human. Um, <laughs> however, the movies turn out okay, so like I guess it's fine. Yeah, like, well I guess now I'm starting to give think, him more money, right? Well yeah. now I'm starting to think that Lyman could have gotten Empires of the Deep made. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Just, it would. He would have been there for years, <laughs> and it would eventually probably got away. done. Yeah. <laughs> just plugging away. Um. Okay, this is uh, Foster about um, final thoughts on Doug working with Doug Lyman on Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Akiva and I figured out how to reverse engineer it, and we dealt with it. We made it work. For all of Doug's stuff, he actually made the movie better. Mm. His special sauce that he adds. That weird elliptical view of things is the difference between movies like Triple X and ours. Even with all the Sturm und Drang, it led to a better movie. I mean, <sighs> the movie was fine. It was fun. Like I enjoyed watching <laughs> yeah, it. I'm it's surprised a fun I'm movie. Su- I'm surprised I hadn't seen it before. Oh, you, you never, never had? I never saw it until you gave me the homework. Oh, so yeah. I, it was always kind of like on my like like yeah, watch that deep seller radar of like oh yeah like, I remember that oh yeah I'll watch it eventually you know deep like, seller <laughs> with a fuel tank radar. yeah <laughs> where the robot's gonna drop the, the grenade in. it's like uh, yeah but I mean it was it was, it was fun it was fine uh, speaking of that Mr. and Smith released June 10th 2005 grossed 186 million in the US 
487 million worldwide. So it was a big hit over uh, overall, um, a little over budget. So here in the U.S. with marketing, probably they they kind of just barely went like, yeah. above. Uh, Nearly broke even, probably. Yeah. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, 59 percent with critics. 48% with audience. That low? Yeah. I oh, actually that's think weird. that's kind of weird because yeah, I actually it's, it, like, think it's a little better than that. It, yeah, it's it's like a it's a kind of a silly movie but like it's fun. Like it's a yeah. it's a fun movie to watch. Like it's got yeah. great action scenes. They have amazing chemistry. I yeah. remember like sitting there watching like, "Oh yeah, I forgot how sexy this movie is." This is a sexy movie. <laughs> that's a sexy movie. Like you're you're right. Like it's it's a fun little action adventure yeah. you know, with comedy and sexiness sprinkled in. I just do remember watching like the the end climactic battle in like, in the, like the in the department store. Right. Where they're like weaving intertwine each other with their guns and stuff like that. Like all right, that's a little silly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> actually, that's that's actually the least the favorite part of that whole movie. Yeah. I think that shot should have been a single shot sequence. Yeah, it, it kept going. I was like all right, like I know no one shoots like that, and there's no way you can get any sort of like accuracy. And, like, Shooting a shotgun off someone's back. <laughs> yeah, I guess, but but yeah, it went on a little too long. Uh, okay, so both Pitt and Jolie maintained that there was no infidelity during filming. Many people have stated that they were just bonding over their failed marriages. So mm. he was going through the rocks with Jennifer Aniston. She had two failed marriages at that point, I think. Um, one with Billy Bob Thornton. Um, their relationship was rumored throughout 2004 and 2005, um, but not publicly official until January of 2006 when they announced that they were having a child. Um, at the, um, this is from the New York Times. Jolie looks forward to the day when she can put Mr. and Mrs. Smith into the DVD player for their children. Quote, not a lot of people get to see a movie where their parents fell in love. Huh. So... You can stream it now, kid. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> now there's there's there. So that's kind of interesting. It was like confirming that they did fall in love while right, they were making right, that movie. Right. Whether or not they did anything, who knows? Who knows? But uh, also, but like, whatever. It's who not our bit. None of our business. Pitt and Jolie divorced in 2016, among many reasons. One being potential abuse allegations against Brad Pitt. Um, mm -hmm. not a gossip podcast you can look into it there's been a lot like the FBI looked into this whole thing that happened the FBI looked yeah, into yeah. it holy uh, shit yeah it happened on a plane and all this kind of stuff mm. that, um, but he has not been uh, brought up on any charges after this movie Lyman made Jumper uh, which he says uh, completed his sellout trilogy <laughs> In 2007, Kinberg wrote and Lyman directed a TV pilot by the same name, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that takes place six months after the film ends. It stars Martin Henderson from one of the greatest films ever made, Torque. Uh, <laughs> what, the, what the fuck are you talking about? And, what? And, yeah, I was like, what are these movies? And Jordana Brewster from Fast oh, and Furious. Oh. I was uh, like, I know who that is. This, yeah. I've heard of those this movies. This entire pilot is on YouTube. Oh, I do not recommend watching it. Oh, no. It is horrible. Uh. <laughs> um, these two are terribly miscast, mm. um, especially Jordana Brewster. Did, it's not even playing remotely the same character. Mm. She's very like, Jordana Brewster has that the girl next door kind of yeah, like, vibes. thing. And that's how she played the character, right. which is not at all how Jolie played that character. Oh, yeah. And so it's like, this is supposed to be the same people. It's like, this that, that doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Needless to say, ABC did not pick it up for a series. <laughs> YouTube's got it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in 2021, Amazon announced a TV series based on the film to be written and starring both Donald Glover and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. <gasps> So it was like a really great like That'd be fun. two oh people across the pond who were very good writers and yes. um, uh, good co comedians. And um, it was like, oh, that's really cool. And like have really good, solid TV shows under their belt. Yeah, Atlanta exactly. Atlanta and Fleabag, right? Yeah. Uh, she left early on citing creative, creative differences. differences. Yes. And was later replaced by Maya Erskine. Oh, from uh, Pen15. Pen15. I love her. She's great. She's great. So this is going to probably come out this year. Um, no information what. Uh, it was picked up as a straight to series order. So it has to be made. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> um, so, but there was some casting and stuff like announced. So it, it is happening. 
Uh, okay. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, worth it. Uh, I mean, I went this far with never seeing the movie up until now. <laughs> and like... You know I, that, and then that robot, and did you really kind of sold me? Yeah, it was like I saw that robot <laughs> drop that grenade, and I was like, "God damn it! Why have I never seen this? I, I, I've never God lived damn until it, now." This movie's good. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, did you realize how empty your life was before? I, I, well, that's the thing. Is like my mm-hmm. life is just like it's exact thing. It's unchanged. <laughs> it's unchanged. Whether or not I had seen that movie or hadn't seen that movie. I mean, I always approach this question, I guess, from the perspective of like how much pain and suffering people were put through, and then like like where the product landed like like how like what the the end product of the movie was and like how good it was and this one is hard because it sounds like people were just like oh my god we're so fucking tired of his bullshit (laughs) but you know like at the end of the day like the movies you know it was great the movie turned out great and so like we're all fine with it so it sounds like there wasn't too like there's like mixed opinions about him from the people who work directly with him they're like look we knew he's a pain in the ass but we figured it out and we made like a solid movie so like it's fine and yeah. the movie is, it's fine. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the only reason I would say it wasn't worth it is because it's things like this that just kind of like encourage his behavior. Yeah. For <sighs> sure. Yeah. Which is just like, yeah. all right. Yeah. For sure. Like, I mean, like Boosts I said at the beginning of it, where he says, I always get my way. Yeah. 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 Right? yeah. So I'm, I'm going to say for that, Boo. like it, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, as far as the movie goes, like it's, it was, it was fine. Like I think those Rotten Tomato scores are probably pretty. Accurate, but you could still watch those movies and still just enjoy the shit out of them. I like Ray yeah. loves Batman and Robin and Batman forever. So I mean, this movie. I mean, people is are no crazy. Batman people are just crazy. <laughs> this movie's no Batman and Robin. I'll say that. No, I'll, you know, you know, I would watch Batman forever before I'd watch Mister and Mrs. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the thing is like when we were gonna watch it, I was like, oh, I've seen this mov- movie before. I remember it being fine, and we watched it, and I was like, oh, this is kind of a fun movie. And then I was like, am I gonna go out of my way to watch this movie again? Nope, sure won't. I I'm I'm I think I like this a little bit more than both of you. Um, I think I like it more than most people. I think it's actually really entertaining. I mm. um, uh, I love the camera work in it is really kind of fun and dynamic. The part where she jumps off the the the, the side hotel. of the building, yeah, it was like really cool. That was awesome cool. shot, awesomely shot. That whole per- poker scene too was a lot of fun. Yeah, and and like I love the idea of how how that kind of weird like. Yeah. How he just kind of stumbles his way through this shit, and she's so methodical. She's so professional about oh, it. Yeah. I um, related to that super hard as well because it's like pretty much every woman I know is like that, and then every works. man. Yeah, yeah, every man I, like stumbles like, ass backwards into a job. Seriously, was was Doug Lyman like Brad Brad Pitt? You Players are like me. me. You are me as a spy. <laughs> You're gonna just stumble ass backward into through this spy situation and like still somehow come out on top, and then Angelina Jolie's like. I have an army of like hot chicks <laughs> at my disposal. I have like money. I got like this swanky ass like giant loft that where all my spy dealings occur. Like she's like organized, and somehow Brad Pitt still like comes out on top. Like, <laughs> yeah, I like that. I found slightly annoying. <laughs> However, the moment in the movie where it they both realize the other person is a spy, but they're kind of like not saying anything, and they become like there's that little fun cat and mouse game that kind of that starts and like. They're having the dinner and there's all that tension. Yeah. And he drops the wine bottle on purpose and she catches it and then like hurries and spills it. Like that stuff is actually really fun. Like yeah, that sure. kind of tension was more fun to me than the outright like action moments, I think. Yeah. I, yeah. The Like I said, like I didn't really care for the like the final shootout. Um, yeah. Uh, I think the van chase is really awesome. That's I fun. think it's so oh, yeah. f- uh, funny and uh-huh. just kind of like a good way of doing action comedy. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, there's like some of it is like it could have been a lot cooler. Some of the dialogue could have been a little bit better. Like there's just like <laughs> there was something that was just kind of missing to make it like a truly a like standout. standout classic. Yeah. But um, Jolie, like I think Jolie's character is a little underbaked comparatively um, to uh, Pitt. But I think Pitt is so fucking funny in this movie. Mm. The part like his phys- you're right. Like his his physical comedy in this is so good. Yeah. Like the part where the light stand falls over and he's catching it with his leg and then he like swings around the wrenches or when he gets mad about her stealing all his guns and he comes out of the the shed and he's all like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's just like air punching. Yeah, air punching yeah. and like and that there's a really just great moment where uh they're talking about how many kills they've had and she goes 300 or something and he's just like ah. Just, what? Just give me a minute. 
<laughs> like his little hand wave is so good. Like yeah. I think he's so good in that movie. Um, yeah, I just wish it was just a little bit better. Like the tango wasn't as fun as I wanted it to be. Mm. Um, but I, t- I, I do think that there's, uh, there's a lot to really like in this movie. I, I do have to say one of the funniest things is when we started this, not to keep triggering Ray, but <sighs> um, <when laughs> whatever you very, love it. <laughs> very early in where um, she's like, how do you like my new curtains? And he's like, oh, and he just like un- oh uncommittedly. Oh my God. And that, then she goes, that scene is marriage. <laughs> that scene for any, oh, mm, that scene is the definition of a marriage. But okay, so then she goes, "Well, so I really like um I uh, like the curtains, but we're going to have to reupholster the couch." And then he and then he says, uh he's like, "Or we don't have to do any of those things." And January goes, "Trigger." <laughs> Trigger. She's like- Oh and it's just God. like, it's such a perfect encapsulation of like, she has ideas that she wants to do things and then the guy doesn't want to. Yeah. But it, like, like, or we could just go back to the old curtains and then we wouldn't have to do any of this shit. And I was just like, I am going to flip a table right now. <laughs> Holy shit. But it's so like, it's so like perfect kind of thing is like. Yes, I completely understand from your perspective of like, oh, I want new curtains and blah, blah, blah. But reupholster the couch? That's fucking stupid. That is every conversation that Ian and I have, by the way. Every single one. Yeah, I noticed you. I, I mean, I noticed you had new curtains up there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not talk about that, Clint. <laughs> oh, actually, Clint, you're right. Now that I think about it, I did get a new couch, but the curtains are still the old curtains. So we're going to have to get new curtains, I guess. Uh <sighs> Okay, um, to wrap this up, this is one of my favorite quotes from Doug Lyman that I absolutely love <sighs> uh, of anything that we've ever done. Almost anything can be justified as a style of filmmaking if it works. <sighs> <sighs> wow. Like, it's just so, it's like, so, it's so accurate, yeah. but it's so fucking arrogant yeah. Yeah. And, and ridiculous, like. And it just <laughs> encapsulates everything about, like, what we talk about with shit shows, where it's just like, well, yeah, we all stumbled around and, like, f- fell bass backwards and things, and, like, people, people broke got their hurt. legs and people got hurt, yeah. like, whatever, but, like, we made a movie, and it's just like. That dog died? Yes, but. <laughs> but it's okay, it's a great movie. But, like, did it all of that have to happen to make this movie? <laughs> Who cares? It worked. It worked, though. So Machiavellian. He's an evil yeah. genius. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that fucking quote. <laughs> it's so insane. <laughs> all right. Jenny Ray, follow up. Follow ups. We heard from a few of our uh, Patreons who watched our ranking video um, about Shrek and. We are sorry that Shrek did not rank as high as some of you, a.k.a. me, would have liked on the list. Are a we lot of sorry, people... though? Like, I'm willing to die on this hill. Shrek is so... not as good as people think Clint, it is. Clint, the people have spoken. Yeah. And a Shrek, lot of people have Shrek mentioned Shrek is this. an S-tier movie. I don't, I don't get it. I don't. <laughs> I think I think if, if the, the only the first Shrek existed, it would um it would probably go down as a lot more classic yeah. than um than it yeah. than it's been kind of washed out. Well, and um a lot of people have asked about this and yes, due to Clint's opinion about Shrek, we are actively working on replacing him with Tony Bancroft. Yeah. So So, yeah. Um, so you were saying you're going to stay and so I mean the offer's out there, so <laughs> I, Tony, I can, Tony, I can see to Tony. To <laughs> oh, and I think there's someone from someone from Argentina that said that they would uh, gladly replace you. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are so many people gunning for my job. <laughs> yeah, Literally. you gotta stay on top of it, you some bitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, some follow up about misleading trailers. So other trailers that people mentioned that were misleading. We've got March of the Penguins. So that one was very interesting because uh, a lot of people kind of pointed out that. That parents thought that that was gonna be like a fun penguin movie. I don't. I don't understand. Like, like a live action, realize, like Happy Feet. Sort yeah, of they thing? didn't. Yeah, they didn't, they realize, didn't realize it was, like it was a, a documentary. documentary. They didn't realize it was gonna be a National Geographic documentary, which has like death in it. Right, because so, like nature is doesn't care about yeah. your feelings. So I mean, <laughs> you think about that. Shit. You think about that year. That movie was huge. Oh yeah. Like, it's like the highest grossing documentary, like, ever. But whether or not that was misleading to people, I Mm. don't understand. (laughs) I don't remember seeing the trailers, but, yeah, I don't know. That does seem weird because it's like, but it's like, it's real penguins, you guys. Like, look at them. 
They're that, not that, animated. You know, that started the trend of everybody wanting Morgan Freeman to narrate their life. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly. so true too. Exactly. Uh, Alien 3? I th- want to say we mentioned this in the other one um, and then we edited it out. But Alien 3 has a teaser trailer that says um, people can't hear hear you scream in space, which was the original Alien thing. Right. But they can hear you scream on Earth, leading people to believe that the third Alien movie would take place on Earth. That was because they made that trailer before the movie ever got fucking made. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and, uh, and it doesn't even take place on Earth. Take place uh, on Earth. Yeah. I see. I see. So absolutely misleading in a way. Mm. Um, we were apparently very wrong about kangaroo movies, so we've heard from a lot of Australians and other fans of kangaroos um, that there are many, many, many movies starring kangaroos. So we, apparently we have to have a kangaroo movie marathon, but um, James Rath said, Crocodile Dundee absolutely had kangaroos in the film. There were drunk Australian hicks shooting kangaroos. Mick Dundee grabs a kangaroo corpse and starts shooting the drunks, and the drunks think the kangaroos are shooting back. Totally forgot about I that scene. I do not remember this. It's very early I in don't, the movie. I don't know how I don't remember that because that sounds absolutely <laughs> balls to the wall crazy and amazing. But yeah, a couple other people pointed out that there's this movie called Warriors of Virtue about Fuck. like yes. kangaroo ninja. <laughs> yes. I loved this movie. I d- did not know it existed. Neither did I. I will watch I, it immediately. I literally like, I don't know why, like, as I love this movie, I had the toys. They were part of Clint's closet originally. I forgot <laughs> about this movie until we, until we started talking about it. I was like, oh my God, Warriors of Virtue. They were, they, were, they were ninja crank kangaroos, like jump around, flying around. It's like Avatar with yeah. can- kangaroos. Yeah. And there's one that was like, a, he was like the metal kangaroo. And I was like, that dude was fucking <laughs> tight. I love that. I love that dude. I had it's, that toy. I was flipping around. Yeah. Oh I did God. not look it's into so it, crazy. but watching that trailer, I was kind of like, holy shit, this seems, like, there's a lot of work. Like, it wasn't just like the shitty, like, straight to video kind of quality to yeah. look to it. Because, I mean, it's very 90s. But, like, if you put yourself in a 90s nine set, I was just like, holy shit, th- this looks actually kind of big budget in a way. Way. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the kangaroo people are fucking freaky. Um, <laughs> and then, like, someone pointed out, like, Ice T is a kangaroo person and Tank, Tank Girl. Girl. That's her. <laughs> right. That's yeah, her... Oh, that's right. Oh, my God. Tank Girl. That's, that's, her, boy... King... that's her boyfriend, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> kangaroo loving. Anyway, so apologies. We can now think of many film stars. <laughs> so there you go. But yeah, we still have not come up with any other movies with marionettes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. So then Bear Gore wrote in and said, I was six years old when as a special treat, my mom took me to the cinema and let me pick out the movie. I was incredibly excited for Kangaroo Jack and couldn't wait to enjoy this very special night with just us two. I cried on the way home. (laughs) Not only was I disappointed, but I still remember thinking how unbearably awful from a kindergartner's perspective, at least it was. And my mom telling me it was one of the worst things she had sat through in years. I was convinced my mother would absolutely never do movie date night with me again. While that would end up being true, oh, we did stop by a store and pick up a VHS copy of Willy Wonka, so it ended up being a pretty okay rest of the evening. Still, I hope everyone responsible had or continues to have miserable lives as a result. <laughs> That's I love that. Comment. Traumatic. That is. That is <laughs> Kangaroo that's Jack so is cute and so trauma. terrible. And so sad. <laughs> well, I just think like this ruined this like special like tradition with yeah. this with Bear Gore and his mom. <laughs> right. Yeah. Blush Slice said, "I saw Kangaroo Jack as a little kid and was so mad. I memorized Jack's lines in the trailer and had basically dedicated my whole personality to that marsupial." <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> hey, it's, uh, um, that, who's that kid? Oh, he's, that's that weird kangaroo Jack kid. He's like really into kangaroo he's Jack. Really he's just hopping like down the hallway. He, he just, does like, not wash that red hoodie. He doesn't wash that red hoodie. He's always like, hello, whenever you try to say hi to him. He's a fucking weird kid. I said a hip hop. Oh. A to the hip to the hip hip hop. He just, he just walks around just like rapping like with an Australian accent. It's fucking weird. You, when you hand stuff to him, he like reaches out with like T-Rex arms. <laughs> oh my God. Uh. <laughs> he started wearing a tail. <laughs> Uh, poor Bush uh, says, says says the guy who, who wore, wore a, a Superman cape. 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 Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Sewed onto his T-shirt. <laughs> and then, last but not least, we have a review from Wit two six eight seven from the U.S. Um, Wit says this is one of my favorite recent podcast discoveries. Great comedic chemistry with the hosts, backed up by incredibly interesting information and factoids on the making of some of the biggest financial and critical box office failures. 
as a film lover, hearing the in-depth stories of how these failures happened are far more interesting than hearing about successful movies. Highly recommend listening and subscribing. (laughs) Oh, thank you. So, uh, thanks, Wit. And yeah, if you want to have your review read out on the podcast, go leave one. Go find us and leave us a review. (laughs) For the last portion of this, again, this is we're going to be talking about some of our new um, $10 tier Patreon. Our meddling um, executives. Meddling executives who just uh, give us all the notes. But we're going to we're going to talk about them and give them some flattering lies. We just got the most recent edition of Variety. And uh, people, <laughs> and uh, the Daily Mirror, and the Sun, and Us Weekly. Yeah. We went and bought all the periodicals, and we oh, we have some shit to tell you guys <laughs> about these meddling executives. They're just like us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but better. Maybe. Uh, first one is Sequoia, who we've had on the podcast. Um, I didn't know that she was genetically engineered to be perfect. I did not know that. Mm. I I mean, I had her. I mean, I'd witnessed her glory in, in person and it was just like, she <laughs> has to be some kind of clone because there's no way that someone is this amazing. Yeah, no, I, all of my ailments went away when I was around her. Like, yeah. I came in with like a cough and a sniffle. As soon as I left, yeah, yeah. I was fine. Just like, your, oh, uh, Your ankylosis. My sp- ankylosing spondylitis, <laughs> my back problem and all that. Gone. Went away. I can do a Shh. fucking backflip. <laughs> She vomited into your drink, <laughs> I think, at one point, and then like you were magically I was, healed. Yeah, yeah. She so she may or may not be a pod person. Um, mm-hmm. unclear but a pod person point. for the good. For the good, yes. Good of- Which was the goal of pod people. Again, like <laughs> yeah, I kind of side with the pod people on that one. They feel more inclusive than the world we live in now. So uh, the next one was Mark Yeager. Um, which I found out created Jägermeisters. Hmm. Um, he did like ah, he so, was the original Jägerbomb guy. Yeah, he threw up in yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a drink. No, he just threw up everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and people know. just started drinking it and going, "Hey, this is <laughs> we'll call this Jägermeisters." Oh, yeah, yeah. At the you know in the nineties as a way to sell um his family's disgusting liqueur that they made. He was just like, <laughs> "All right, you guys, look, we got to push units." We got to move this Jaeger. I'm the Jaeger Meister. We got to move this. <laughs> and that's um, how he made his millions. And then he just like, he would, he was like the guy who like sneaked into all like the frat houses and was like, Jaeger bomb. And then, and then like, just disappeared. Became, and then yeah, he would just, just like, gone, yeah. like fade in the background and just became a thing. What the fuck was that guy? He had his own Jaeger smoke bomb. Did someone just, just say just Jaeger bomb? Yeah. <laughs> Ironically, a Jaeger bomb is actually the first drink that Ian ever made me. Oh my god! I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> that's your fault, Mark. And so the legacy, <laughs> you motherfucker. Look, Mark has touched all of our hearts and our souls and our stomachs and yeah. our hangovers yep. throughout our life. So you know. Well, you know, I I was reading a lot about this Chad Lewis guy, uh, and did you know that he is actually the man behind Dr. Seuss, like for real. Like Dr. Like, Seuss, like had a pseudonym, like he was really like Theodore or something, right? But no, 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 it was it was it was Chad Lewis. It was Chadador Lewis. Yeah. So yeah, didn't he have like he always wore we- really weird stuff, like like giant hats? Yeah, giant stuff. red white striped hats. He had, you know, he was the original thing. Like there's thing one and thing two. His just said thing. <laughs> it was Ooh, the thing. thing. It says thing prime. Yeah. Thing prime. <laughs> he was really. Um. He did though. I heard have kind of a complex about the size of his hands. So he. <laughs> would wear those like giant, giant with like, those white gloves white gloves yeah, yeah. to kind of compensate bit of a clean freak um, yeah so but, i mean like knowing who he is as a person it's like oh of course like yeah, the yeah. world of seuss is like based very much yeah the the the, the vehicles he would ride in on mm-hmm. on yeah. a daily basis fucking fascinating yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thingamajiggers <laughs> <laughs> i'm like struggling <laughs> I'm like, what are what are all the things? What are all the Seuss things called? Well, no, he's he's very a he's, wampum he, cycle. Well, or he was something. also very you know the, he was the very much inspiration behind the Lorax because he actually went mm. down to the rainforest and murdered a bunch of uh, tree you know choppers, mm-hmm. Onceslers. <laughs> yeah, he was responsible for the genocide of the Onceslers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But he saved the trees. So yeah, that's he saved, right. saved the trees. He, yep. he speaks and murders yeah, for the, the trees. trees. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you for the money, Chad Theodore Seuss Lewis. <laughs> doctor. Oh, sorry. Excuse He's me, doctor. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kim. Um, so Kim Fruth, have you guys heard about Kim? She is now 
one of our meddling executives. Mm-hmm. Yes. I heard that uh, that Kim has the world's largest collection of antique coins. Could you believe that? I do. I do believe it. And she cl- and she has them it. in a giant vault that she swims in. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, backstrokes. Like she backstrokes yeah. Them yeah. And like inhales them and goes. She spits, spits them out. Yeah. Them out her, oh, oh, this is oh, this is um. Her maiden name is um. McDuck. McDuck. McDuck yeah. This is Kim McDuck Fruit. <laughs> yes. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Of course. From the McDuck of the, of the McDuck family. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I wish she would like share those coins a little bit. Yeah. But, I, mean, I mean, she did ten dollars <laughs> worth per month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes, um... or at least let us dive around. Yeah, in let, your us coins have, let us too. let us go to go for a swim in your money bin. We were playing chicken in, in the money sock. bin, and I got a concussion when I fell over. <laughs> I tried to die <laughs> straight in. <laughs> Boom! Ankylospondylitis came back. Bring it right back. Came uh, right back. But yes, it was a shit show. Is now a subsidiary of McDuck uh, and Enterprises. Enterprises. <laughs> so, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Warpat or Warpat. Um, also, did not know this. Formerly. A warrior of virtue. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, so they're, yeah, they're, that's they're... right. This is the one of the metal, the king, the metal kangaroo. The metel kangaroo. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Warapat Teramals. Yeah. Flipping around. They, Such a badass know, name. They, they 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 taught me the the virtue of you know just being yourself. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, also showing off wicked kangaroo airbending skills. Yeah, oh, yeah. Some, dan- some, some, some kangaroo ninja moves. They were they were the inspiration for this warrior virtue. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. And are now the inspiration behind this podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, even though we didn't know it going into it. Yeah, we it, had no idea. And then suddenly talk about kangaroos just made it all come back. Right. Yep. We're like, we've never heard of this movie, but now suddenly we're also part of Warrior of Virtues Enterprises. <laughs> Amazing. So many mergers. Yeah. Speaking of mergers. <laughs> a lot the, of mergers and acquisitions. Speaking of mergers, the person who put that all together is, uh, you know, this Eon Stormcrow, the leader right. of all of, of the... our mergers and acquisitions team. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Um, but he literally... Yes. flies in and grabs it with the claws of his like his crow claws. Oh, crows yeah. are really smart. Like have you guys seen those videos of of crows, crow kind like putting, you know, they're like yeah. putting shapes in little things? From what I understand, the crows were dumb until Eon Stormcrow started training them. Yeah, do ah. we yeah, do we fail to mention that Eon Stormcrow is a literal An anthropomorphic crow. crow? Yeah. And oh, and I mean, we might be on the verge of uh the crows being the dominant race <laughs> on the on planet Earth because mm-hmm. of him. Yeah. But I mean, again, maybe, you know, speaking for the trees kind of scenario, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it is yeah. a good thing. Yeah, you thought it was dolphins? Fuck those guys. It's crows. <laughs> Oh, crows. the water dries up. Those dolphins are screwed. They crows, are though. Yeah, they can Own fly the over. They fly Own over the place. the skies. <laughs> it was actually originally going to be the crows that took the rings to Mordor. <laughs> uh, but Let they were me like, you, you guys this. need to learn a lesson yeah. by working together. Because <laughs> we've already solved that. Yep. <laughs> it's Clinton to crows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our next one is Jamal. And Jamal created the entirety of what we know as murder mysteries. Yeah. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I owe so much of my life to him. And your personality. And my personality. (laughs) Because you're changing it constantly. Like the base of of what card you pull in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you thought it was Agatha Christie? Nope, nope, it was Jamal. Yeah. Jamal taught her everything Mm -hmm. he knows. Yeah, I mean, he frequently has to murder people to make this work, Mm -hmm. but it's fine because it's, it's, Provided it's so method. much. Yeah, it's method. It's method. Well, he method. works. He works backwards. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He does the yeah. murder first, and then he goes backwards. And, and then, then he's, he's like, like "How did I do this?" <laughs> yes, exactly. And so he's mm. providing something for us to do. You know, he's he's exercising yeah. our brains. Right. Right. Look, I know how I committed this murder. <laughs> you tell me how I did. How I did it. <laughs> it's, um, it's like that uh, O.J. Simpson's book. If I did it, here's how. I yeah, did it. yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> right. But but he was murdering all people that deserved it. He's of course, he's kind of, of dexter course, course. in that way. Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay, we can all agree this person needed to go. <laughs> and and the way and the way he the way he murders is so it's so creative. Yeah. Like that's you, the mystery part. You, that's you where just, it gets fun. Yeah, you don't. You think it's gonna be like a gun or a knife, and it always turns out to be like a bowling trophy. Or... Yeah, <laughs> sometimes a literal Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He literally asked Rube Goldberg to kill someone yes. for him. A Rube Goldberg murder machine, which is the most 
it's the least effective way, but the most creative for sure right? and entertaining <laughs> for, you know, those of us who like a murder mystery. That sounds like a heavy metal, like, band name, like Rube Goldberg Murder Mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, our next metal ex- executive is the lead singer of Rube Goldberg Murder Machine, <laughs> yeah. um, which is a, an Icelandic death metal band. Yeah. And man, they're good. So yeah. Amy- Surprisingly, yeah. very soothing to listen to. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I fall asleep to it every night. Every yeah. night. Every very, time, yeah. very soothing. Every time Amy yells, you know, like uh, death incantations <laughs> and like uh, Satanistic, yeah. uh, you know, blood rituals into my ears, puts me right to sleep. Yeah. I love exactly. it. Exactly. The like- the tone of the high pitched like screaming of her vocals <laughs> just kind of eventually becomes white noise, and mm-hmm. you're just like, "God damn, this well, yeah, you would, great!" You wouldn't think it would work, but it is. It works on so many levels. And I hear all the smartest people on the planet all have to listen to her music yeah. to yeah. sleep at night. Yeah, it, exactly. you know, sometimes it like it pumps me up, gets me real angry, but like in a good way. <laughs> yeah, you're mm-hmm. like, I'm gonna channel this anger. To do some good. To go make a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we often just we all just take a minute before before an episode recording and we all just listen to Amy's music. Just zen out to Rube zen Goldberg out. Murder Machine. <laughs> air punching mm, air mm, punching mm, 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 mm. with respect. Yes. And consent. <laughs> air, may I punch you? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about being connected and, yeah. and you know. I, I would have never had that without Amy. Yeah, yeah, all brought to us by Amy. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our meddling executive Patreons. Um, if you would like us to tell flattering lies about you, you can find us uh, at patreon.com slash it was a shit show and sign up. Sign up to be a meddling executive and we will read the next version of Variety and tell all your secrets. <laughs> and then we'll discover the, uh, some obscure ass 90s movie that uh, <laughs> suddenly brings back all the joy. Yo, oh, I'm going to yeah. find that movie again. I'm going to watch that movie again. And I'm going to watch mm-hmm. it and be like, what the fuck was wrong with me? <laughs> You're going to watch it and be like, holy shit, this was amazing. This is the best thing in the world. <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. Why did I ever get rid of those toys? I know. Ah. I had a lot of the toys. I bet you could find them on eBay. Next time we lost him, yeah, we lost him. And next time we we see him, he will be he will done a a bunch of places. I'll have a tattoo. (laughs) You're gonna have like plastic surgery to make yourself look like a kangaroo (laughs) Kangaroo. face. You're gonna make. You're gonna sew a pouch onto your stomach. (laughs) Oh, that'd be gross. Oh no, get a get a plastic surgery kangaroo pouch. Change no. your name to wear a pat Terramals. Yo, Guess I what, had, kids? I your names these. are Joey's. <laughs> Joey now. You're, you're, you're Joey. You're Joey. You're Joey. <laughs> <laughs>